Hi everyone, Stephanie again with the patient story with Justine who's sharing her uh, rectal cancer story with us. This next segment, um, as we talked about Justine is about the treatment, which it happened over several chapters, um, if you will. And so <laughs> you did talk a little bit already about the oral chemo pill that you took. Um, it was five and a half weeks. You said it didn't really disrupt your life. You were able to still teach, um, so still do your job. Is there any last thing about the oral chemo pill that you'd like to share with people, what they should know? Um, you know, I. I did not experience very many side effects. So for me, I have nothing that um, I would would suggest. Um, right. I did pretty well on it. Okay, that's good. It was pretty minimal in terms of side effects. Yes, and they say they say that the pill has less side effects versus like doing it intravenously. Okay. I gotcha. So the pill can be a little easier on you. Okay. So that was one sort of brighter spot throughout this. Um, were you doing radiation at the same time? Yes. Okay. So I would do five days of chemo, five days of radiation. I'd get the weekend off and then I'd continue that. And I did that for five weeks. Talk about the radiation. What was that process like? Um, it's nothing like you envision. I, you know, I, I don't know what I envision, but I didn't envision what happened to me. I mean, you just go in this room, they played the music I like, I laid on a table, and this big machine kind of went around me and made some beeping sounds, and then I was out. Um, it's silent, you don't feel anything. Um, you can have side effects from it, like burning. Um, luckily, I never experienced any of that. Um, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah. But I also found out later on that my tumor really didn't do anything. So uh, okay. during through treatment, so my first set of treatment. So Meaning maybe that's tumor, tumor hadn't really responded to the oral chemo and the radiation. Yeah, like it didn't shrink in size or anything. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so in April is when you ended both. Um, and I'll pop up the picture where you talk about the two girls surprising you. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> was it, it, even though it side effects wise, you didn't feel much, did you feel like your life was very disrupted? I mean, you'd had to go in every day, right? So it seems like it was a lot to logistically have to handle. Yeah. I mean, I was definitely, I feel like I was maybe a little numb to everything. It was still a lot to process. Um, but I went in every day after work and would go to radiation. Um, my mom or my dad met me there every day, um, which it was fast and they couldn't even be in the room with me. So I was always like, you don't have to be there. Um, but then after they did it a few times, I found that I really liked having that support. I liked coming and seeing them and then coming out of radiation and being able to see them. Um, but yeah, other than just like it being an extra place to go after work each day, um, it really didn't disrupt my life a whole lot in the beginning. And were you able to drive yourself to and from okay? Yep, I was able to drive and yeah. Okay, so so again, it sounds like the, the oral chemo, the radiation didn't have side effects really, um, but in terms of efficacy didn't really impact the tumor the way that the doctors wanted it to. Yeah. So um, the plan was next stage was always to do a surgery. Now I know that you had a lot of complications here. And in fact, you spent, did you say 25 days in the ICU? Yeah. Wow. Um, so why don't we talk about, so the plan was, of course, the surgery was to go in, take out the, the tumor. You would have a temporary ileostomy bag. Um, could you sum up what ended up happening in terms of the, the surgery without getting into the details of the complications too much? Yeah, so they ended up removing my tumor and giving me an ileostomy. I ended up losing my large intestine and some of my small. So my ileostomy is not cannot be temporary. It is permanent. But for people going through this process, it would normally be a temporary thing uh, for about six weeks and then you get reconnected back up. Okay. And then looking at this photo, Justine, it's just like, how do you feel when you see this? This was 
when you were, you had to be left open because um, you had explained to me that when the surgeon went in, surprisingly found that your large intestine was dead. And so yeah. it required a lot more surgery. Uh, yeah, so what does this conjure up for you? Um, it definitely a lot of emotions. That was a really hard time. Probably the hardest part of my whole um, journey so far was um, this chunk of time that I had to spend in the hospital being completely helpless and dependent on everybody. Um, it was a really difficult time. Um, and I came through a lot of things that doctors did not expect me to. Like, like what? Um, being alive. Wow. wow. Yeah. I wasn't, when I went in for surgery, they didn't know that I would actually come out. Wow. And so it's definitely emotional. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it was just because all the complications happened and they didn't know, uh, it wasn't planned for. So they were just hoping for the best. Um, yeah. You ended up spending so much time. You ended up going through five surgeries, removal of the dead large intestine, the tumor removal. You had ileostomy resections twice. And then you said it resulted in the loss of most of your small intestine. So what do you remember from waking up from just so many surgeries and being in the ICU? Um, well, the first thing I remember is trying to talk to everybody and nobody could understand me. So I was trying to sign language with them because I teach my students how to sign and nobody knew sign language. <laughs> so then I was trying to write messages. Um, I was like super thirsty and just really uncomfortable and in a lot of pain. Um, and just really had no idea what had just happened to me. It, I mean, it still took being out of the hospital to under fully understand what I went through when I was there. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, you went through something that most people don't ever have to, to, to face or go through. Um, so I know it's a little bit different. Most people won't go through such so many surgeries and it'll be one, and it'll be a little bit of a different experience, but in terms of recovery, it's still same steps in, in terms of, um, having to learn how to move around again and they want to make sure that you're eating okay. Can you talk about that part of the recovery? Um, yeah, I mean, mine again was not quite straightforward. Um, I went a lot longer not being able to eat just because I kept, they kept having to go in um, and I had to be, my bowels had to start working again, which took longer because I kept getting put under um, but your bowels have to wake up and they have to see a certain kind of output before you can try eating. Um, and then once you start eating, it's just learning how to manage your ileostomy or your, I mean, you can get a colostomy too. Um, but it's just learning how to manage that and change that and all of that stuff that comes along with it. I mean, I had no idea what a an ileostomy even was going into this. And even when I was told in my treatment plan, I still didn't look it up. I figured I'll cross that bridge when it comes. Yeah. Take one thing um, at a time, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that bridge, it came a little faster than I had planned. So I just woke up and I had this bag and I had no idea what it entailed. And I'm, I want to dive into that because it's such a big part of the impact to, you know, life changes. This picture you explained to me was your first meal. Yeah. <laughs> Can you describe it again? <laughs> uh, Jello and some chicken broth, a little bit of juice and tea. Um, and I was really excited about this because I went about probably 20 days without eating. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this was your dream meal that you couldn't believe you got to eat. Jello and chicken yeah. broth. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, so so I'm gonna pop up pictures of the ileostomy, and okay. I know that it was learning for you as you were going because you were expecting a temporary one at first, but then you had to get the permanent one. Um, how did they describe? How did the medical team first of all describe ileostomy versus colostomy? You know, and and. And then, and then we'll talk about how you actually learned the real lessons of maneuvering. Yeah. Um, I had a really amazing ostomy nurse. 
um, who was very incredible and she helped, she taught me a lot. Um, but a lot of it was also just self-research um, and learning stuff on my own. I became part of ileostomy groups on Facebook where I've learned a lot through. Um, and I would say that's like one of the biggest ways I've learned. So um, yeah, can you describe, um, so when you wake up, you, were, you woke up with one, what did you have to learn right away? Um, not a whole lot, honestly, because they took they take care of you in there. It's really once you get out learning how to do it. But I had to learn. Um, I I mean, I definitely liked to try to do things on my own. So like trying to empty my bag, I like even just how it, you know, I have easy bags now. They're just Velcro, but there were these weird clips when I was in the hospital that you had to try to learn how to use. And just like when you empty your bag, getting it in the cup and not everywhere else. Um, you have to learn how to change it. So like you have a wafer that sticks to your skin and that only lasts so many days. So you have to learn how to like cut the hole for your stoma and put that on every so many days. Um, so I guess like throughout the process of being in the hospital, I was learning how to do all of these things as well. Wow. And, you know, walk us through just for total beginners, you know, when you're waking up, like how it's actually connected to your body. Uh, I imagine you have to keep, keep it very clean. Um, there's a lot of maintenance around that. Yeah. I mean, it's just basically a giant sticker that sticks to your belly and you don't really get to choose where it goes and it covers whatever. So I never have a belly button because it's always covered by my stuff. It covers some of my scar. Um, you, I mean, you don't get to pick um, how high or low it goes. So even just like figuring out how to dress after was a really big obstacle um, and finding tools to help me dress and just feel normal. Um, you would never know I have my ileostomy just looking at me. Um, it's all very hidden. Yeah, you learned how to, to, you probably get better and better and better too at, <laughs> at all these things. Um, yeah. So to sum it up, I guess, if you could describe to someone who's just about to get one um, themselves, what are the top sort of lessons you've learned about how to navigate life with one and yeah, any tips you have? Um, I would say my biggest thing is research, find groups that um, are, ileostomy groups they're super helpful people ask really great questions um and you know see if you have an ostomy nurse in your area that will be able to help you and guide you once you um are you know recovering and getting out of the hospital they're very helpful there was times I was going through leaks and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get stuff to stick on me and stay and um, I'd go to see her and she could help me um, but also I just researched a lot um, and used the groups that I had okay so find those resources right they're out there absolutely absolutely, absolutely. yeah there's so many um, if you just look I have to ask, um, I could spend forever asking more questions, but I think another part of this, of course, is just mentally dealing with the fact that this is a, a much different change um, that impacts every part of your day, really, um, because you have to consider it. So how did you handle that? How did you, you know, say, okay, you know, get through the shift of this is how my body used to work. Now I have this ileostomy. This is what I'm going to be dealing with indefinitely. Yeah, um, I would say it's, I still struggle with this at times. I'm very used to what my body used to be capable of. Um, it can be frustrating being 32 years old and not being able to do what I used to be able to do. Um, but you need to give yourself grace and um, accept the new body you have. I mean, these bags save your life in, all, in, in the realm of things. Um, most people that have a bag wouldn't be here today if they didn't have the bag. Um, so I had to learn to accept that. Um, I had, I mean, I've definitely worked with a counselor um, on 
just accepting it, um, feeling good about it, being in a relationship and having a bag and being intimate. I mean, it's all a lot of obstacles to um, get past. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that are willing to share ideas and stories um, that can help you through getting, having an ileostomy. Yeah. Just like what you're doing now, Justine, I'm sure people yeah. are looking at you and they're like, Hey, you know, she's beautiful. She's strong. She's, she can do it. Yeah. I can do it too. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Um, well, so thank you for sharing that. And um, I, I also wanted to talk about the caregiver situation because I know for you, and again, your surgery situation was much more heavy and extensive than what most rectal cancer patients will go through with the same treatment plan. But you had said you, you did move in with your parents for some weeks. Um, was that because you just, you needed to have that help? I mean, um, what's the guidance to other patients on what kind of help they might need to arrange after a surgery, even if it's smaller than what you went through? Um, yeah, you, I mean, you might be weak from being in the hospital and laying around. Um, I think they usually say it's about a week in the hospital. Um, so just having help to, as you learn how to navigate your ostomy, um, sometimes you end up with drains and the drains can be right in the way of where you need to put things. Um, so having somebody that's willing to help you with your ostomy, I mean, my mom and I totally teamed up and would change my ostomy together. Um, in the beginning, I wasn't, I was kind of freaked out by it in the beginning. And so having her to help me and, um, guide me was really helpful as well. Um, but yeah, I would just say it's just nice to have somebody there if you are just struggling to get back on your feet. Not all people need that. Um, mine was a lot different and more extensive. Right, right. Were you able to, did, how long did it take for you to be able to walk around uh, by yourself? Um, I probably was about three weeks okay. in the hospital, two or three weeks, well, not two, I would say maybe two weeks okay. Okay. in the hospital, but that again is not super Common. typical. Yeah. yeah right. I would say most people would be up within a couple days. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Actually, you mentioned uh, about the, you know, like emptying the ileostomy bag, how it was helpful to have your mom um, help you with that. Do you have any advice, like any tips or tricks that you learned? Um, uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I definitely found that having like a cup or something to empty into mm -hmm. was easier in the beginning. Um, I kneel down a lot and empty into the toilet um, when I'm at home. Um, so I find that easier. Facing the toilet versus facing away is easier to empty for me. Um, but again, you just, everybody finds their, what works for them. Right. Okay. That sounds good. That, that'll probably help some folks. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so you were with your parents, um, learning to live with the ileostomy. There's your mom. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then in July 8th or so, you said you were back to living at home by yourself. Um, <laughs> how was that transition? Um, it was good. It was hard. I mean, I definitely was really weak, but I was very determined to get back into my own space. Um, so um, I did it, but it wasn't easy. Um, the biggest thing was like, I couldn't lay, you lose a lot of your core strength mm -hmm. and I couldn't like lay flat. Um, so having enough pillows to prop me up when I was at my parents, I had a bed that could raise. Mm -hmm. um, but it was good to be back in my own space, a little overwhelming to start doing all of the, the care on my own though. Right, right. I, I, you mentioned that's a great tip too, is just to make sure you, to be expecting, um, you know, different people recover differently. Again, you had more extensive surgery, but you needed more pillow support for instance. Um, so these are things that you had to figure out at home. Um, and then I see, in August, you went back for scans and it was supposed to be preparation for the cleanup chemo. Mm -hmm. But then of course, life happens. <laughs> um, and there was another unexpected sort of surprise. Can you talk to us about what, what happened then? 
Yeah. Um, so once I was strong enough to go through ke clean up chemo, my team had me come in for um, scans, but just um, kind of give them a baseline of what everything, how everything was looking. In those baseline scans, they found that my cancer had spread to my liver. Um, again, not the news I was ever expecting. I've never even crossed my mind that that would have happened. Um, so it was definitely another um, really hard conversation. Um, they decided to continue. I was supposed to, I got these baseline scans. I was supposed to get my my port on Monday and get start chemo. They decided for me to keep my, get my port still. And then um, they had to kind of come up with a new plan um, of treatment for uh, cancer that had spread, which is considered metastatic. Right, right. So you had, by, by then it became, went 3B to four because it had spread. Um, yep. How did you, I just have to ask in this moment, you, you'd already been through so much stage three B was already a lot to swallow when you, mm -hmm. I know you didn't expect this. Um, how are you able to, you know, mentally, I guess, equip yourself, um, for this change all of a sudden? Um, I still wonder how I got through all of these like moments. Um, I remember when my doctor called and I was in the shower and I still answered and just crying. Um, I think you have to allow yourself to still grieve. Um, but then for me, just continuing on and still sharing my story and um, kind of continuing, you know, doing what I love is really important to me. You become, cancer can kind of become your story and like what is all like consumes your life. That's the topic all the time. Um, so still just having a little bit of normalcy um, was important for me. My students are a huge drive for me to even keep fighting, in all honesty. Um, I adore them and I want to be a good um, role model for them and just persevering through whatever life throws at them. So that's um, really important to me. And so, yeah, just kind of continuing to live my life. Um, and just take the news in stride and allow myself time to cry when I needed to cry, but then get back up and keep going. I love that. I love that you gave yourself, as you mentioned earlier, the grace to be able to, and the space to be able to grieve and then process the emotions that way, not let it bottle up and then just try and move forward. And um, I think that'll help a lot of people who are listening to this, you know, um, who need thank to hear you. that. Um, so thank you, Justine. Um, I know it moved really quickly. You had your port placed and then there were, there was a biopsy of the tumors, which then was confirmed a few days later that it was cancerous. Um, and they got you started the week later in August 19th, um, August 19th on the IV chemo. So, yeah. um, how did you, first of all, uh, I know when they were biopsying, did you have any sort of anxiety waiting for the results? And, and in the entire process of this cancer, you know, the, the different stages, how have you coped with waiting for results? It's a very tough mental part of uh, the waiting game. Yeah, um, I definitely had to learn. I'm a big planner and I like to know what to expect. I like to plan and uh, stick to that plan. And cancer kind of like kicked me in the ass and said, you better lose that right now. So I had to learn very early on that I couldn't plan. I had to really just take it day by day. Um, honestly, when they told me I had tumors on my liver, there wasn't, I really didn't felt even feel like I needed a biopsy to confirm. I mean, I already had cancer. The yeah. fact that it had spread was not shocking. Um, so to me, for me, the biopsy didn't hold a whole lot of weight. Yeah. I already knew and was like, kind of thinking like, okay, this is the deal. Right. Um, I still didn't really realize just what met metastatic cancer meant though. Mm -hmm. Um, that you never, you're never, you're cure, you're treatable, but you're not curable is how the doctors describe it. Mm -hmm. So I never get to escape this. This is always going to be part of my life. Um, 
And that's something I still struggle with from time to time. That's a hard realization. Um, But again, I kind of allow myself to feel those feelings and then continue on. Mm. Um, Yeah. I can't remember what else you asked. No, no, that's, that's exactly what I'd asked about. And so, and we'll dive into that with the third segment because you are such an example. You said you wanted to be for your, your students. And I can't think of a better role model um, in terms of that perseverance message. So we'll definitely talk about that in a little bit. Um, So talking about the IV chemo, Justine, you went through um, eight rounds, it says. Can you describe what the uh, plan was with the IV chemo, the drugs, and then, yeah, walk us through the side effects and how you got through that? Yeah, um, so the plan was to start with, um, I think, eight rounds of chemo is like the cleanup version. I ended up going through about 13, I believe, um, just because they kept trying to get my tumors a little smaller in order to do procedures. Um, And so it was kind of back and forth, like you're gonna do eight and then they would kind of reevaluate and then they were like, well, we want you to do two more rounds. So I went back and forth a lot. I never really knew just how many um, I was gonna end up doing, but the intravenous chemo is definitely a lot rougher. I like to, think, uh, well, when I was going through it, I like to think I was doing really well. Um, but looking back, it was very miserable. Um, it made me extremely sick. Um, a lot of vomiting, no appetite. Um, you get a cold sensitivity from it that is terrible. So I couldn't eat anything cold or drink anything cold. I had to heat everything up. Um, or else it felt like kind of like shards of glass in your mouth, even the cold to step outside. And we live in Montana and I was going through this starting in September. So I had to go through this in winter as well. Mm. Um, I'd step outside and just to even breathe through my nose, my nose would feel like pieces of glass in it. My fingers, it hurt my fingers to touch anything cold. Um, I would say the cold sensitivity was definitely a really big thing. And then I ended up with neuropathy in my fingers and toes. Right. Which is a numbness that you felt um, in, in the in the fingers and the toes, right? And what, what helped you get through some of these side effects? I mean, I guess, did you just have to always wear gloves and so you're heating food up and yeah. Yeah, I, I would heat my cereal up, <laughs> which is so gross. <laughs> And I wore gloves. I got a vest that was heated with a battery. So I had this vest I wore every day um, over my clothes that was um, heated because I would, I mean, I was miserable. I had no body fat and would get cold easily. So I did that. I just always made sure I was dressed really warm, yeah. warmed my things up. Um, and, and the rounds, oh, can you name the drugs for us, the chemo that you were going through? Yeah, so it was called oxaliplatin and um, Fulfox is the name of the other one. Okay, and uh, I know you said 13 rounds. What did each round mean? So was it like one straight week of infusions or was it one day? How long were they? So it was a day of infusions and then... Um, One of the drugs, which I believe, I actually can't, I think it's the full Fox is, um, so I would get infused for a day in the cancer center. And then I'd leave and I'd go to our home health and I'd get hooked up to another chemo, which was in a ball that I would then carry for three days um, while it um, kind of went into me. And then that ball would empty after three days I'd get to disconnect and then I'd get to wait until I would go two weeks. Two weeks off? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, two weeks off. Okay. So you'd go in for a Thursday, I'd like go in for a Thursday and then I would get, yeah, I would go back two weeks later. Got it, okay. So each round was, two. each cycle, if you will, was two weeks. Yeah. Um, And the side effects really hit right away, would you say? And did they last the entire time? Yeah. So um, the cold sensitivity, like as soon as they started infusing, it starts within like 10 minutes. Okay. Um, 
And then it would, the cold sensitivity in my mouth would subside about maybe like a week and two days after I got infused. And then I could start maybe eating a little bit of cold stuff again. And then I'd basically start chemo again, and then it would go back. So I'd get like maybe three days where I could eat things that weren't totally warm. Okay. Right. So three quote normally sort of days yeah. um, before you had to start it all over again. Um, yeah. Yeah. 13 rounds is a lot. Um, of course it's a long time. And, um, I mean, it's, it's like half a year. <laughs> and yeah. so how did you, do you have any guidance for people on how to get through such an extensive treatment period mentally? Yeah. I mean, definitely. Well, physically as well, make sure you have a good, um, nausea, nausea bed. Um, that was helpful to me. Um, but just staying positive, um, knowing that it's temporary and that you will get through it. Um, use the people, your support system around you. Um, when people ask how they can help, don't be afraid to ask for things which I am not super good at. So, um, but I mean, if it's that you need a meal, I mean, don't be afraid to ask people for those things um, so that you can focus your energy and your strength on treatment and fighting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if there's ever a time for people to step up for you and for you to accept that help, it's it's during this time, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about, I know towards the end of the IV chemo, because it ended in April of 2020, and we all know what happened before that, which was the pandemic, the COVID yeah. pandemic. And so you had to end IV chemo um, without anyone around you. How, how, how was the experience of going through treatment during the pandemic? Um, it definitely sucked. I mean, there's no easy way around it. Um, I really counted on those people being there with me um, and just like entertaining me through it. The day, I mean, it ends up being a long day. It's not comfy, you don't feel well and you like having those people there with you to chat and um, to have to do it alone was hard. Any, any tips for people? I mean, I, hopefully the world will open up again soon but we just never know <laughs> yeah. what we're dealing with, so. Yeah, I mean, just make sure you have like FaceTime people. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely would sit there and FaceTime. Um, if you have a good show or a good book, make sure you bring it. But if you're really missing those, um, the people that help get you through um, the tough time, um, use FaceTime for sure. Yeah, yeah, use the technology. Yeah. Um, so after the chemo happened, did you have to basically um, go through scans? Did they show the impact on the tumors? Because I know then you had to, in 2020, go through targeted radiation and an ablation procedure. So how were they yeah. checking up on you? Um, so I got scans. Um, I'd go through some rounds. They'd do some scans. They'd check in. Um, I started seeing some doctors down in Portland at OHSU, so they were all collaborating and talking about my case and deciding what they felt was the best plan of action. Um, it's been a lot of back and forth because mine hasn't been super straightforward. Um, so yeah, I would just go through, so they might like decide one time, they're like, oh, we'll do two more rounds and then we'll do scans. Um, so I kind of went through that a lot. So again, just having the, just being able to kind of take it day by day, um, and one treatment plan at a time, not looking at the big picture, um, just kind of looking at, okay, what is happening now, um, versus, okay, they're going to do this. And then this is going to happen because that doesn't always, doesn't always work out that way. I mean, there was a time I was going to leave for a procedure and they called me the day before and canceled it. Oh. So you just never, you don't know. And so I found that setting my mind to something didn't do me any good. Um, right. Take it yeah. one step literally at a time, because that's all that you can really handle. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and so I see that um, August of last year, 2020, you did have to go through targeted radiation 
it was for a tumor on your lung. So they found a tumor on your lung. So yeah. obviously not the news you wanted. Um, can you describe the targeted radiation, what that was like? Um, yeah, so again, it was very, so I went through targeted radiation and an ablation procedure as well uh, during that time. So ablation was done on my liver and targeted radiation, which is called SBRT, was done to my lung. SBRT was, I mean, painless, again, kind of like radiation where you're just in there. I did have to do some breath holds. So I had to hold my breath for like 40 seconds, um, which was the toughest part. <laughs> and I had to do that like 15 times per treatment. So I did five days of this. Um, and I'd come each day and go through the same thing. Um, but they just, I mean, they do some baseline scans and some mapping and they give you your tattoos um, that help line them up. And then, yeah, again, it's just kind of painless and you don't really know anything's happening, but. And the ablation, what was that like? The ablation was like a, 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 I actually had to stay in the hospital and got put under and they use probes and they just stick them through your skin and they're hot and they burn the tumors. So I had a couple spots that they went in on. And when you woke up, did you have to recover from anything? Um, yeah, I mean, it was a little painful, um, but it was not, it was a fairly easy recovery. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah. and I know most recently, just a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> you yeah. had to undergo what's called Y90. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, so Y90 is where they insert radioactive beads into, um, they inserted them into my liver. Again, they did a bunch of mapping to kind of check um, through my arteries to check how my blood flow went through my liver. Um, they didn't want to put these beads in and just have them go all over um, and ruin parts of my liver that are still good. So they focused on my right lobe first and um, they put like a catheter in um, to block blood flow to certain parts of my liver. Um, and they do this all through an artery in your groin. Um, and so it was like a day of all this mapping and then figuring out the best path to insert them. And then the next day you come back and they insert the beads. Okay. Um, it was an interesting procedure. I didn't realize how, um, just like going in through your groin, that major artery, how big of a deal that was and how serious that can be. That actually caused me the most pain. Mm. Um, and that you're awake for it all because you have to hold your breath at times. So you're sedated, but aware and able to hold your breath. So like, I can see all this stuff going on, um, which is a little freaky. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it. Um, and do you have any sort of um, advice for people who are going to undergo Y90 themselves? Um, you know, just re again, researching, um, ask the, ask your doctors as many questions as possible. I don't feel like I asked enough questions just to fully understand what I was going to go through. But again, sometimes that's what's best for me. Um, just not it knowing exactly and just going in, I've just learned to really kind of endure a lot of pain and, um, I don't get as nervous anymore. Um, I just kind of go with it. I trust my team and um, I just kind of get through it. Yeah. But again, I mean, it's so hard because, you know, I'd say normally say, you know, embrace your family members and whatnot, but they don't get to be there with you. So, yeah, um, right. And it's helpful. I, you know, I had really great nurses that were very comforting. Um, so making sure you're confident in your, um, where you're receiving treatment is really helpful as well. Mm. Um, so that you just feel comfortable in their hands. My last question before we finish off with the last segment is you mentioned, um, ask questions. Are there any in particular you wish you had asked before the procedure? Maybe just more of what it entailed. Um, I just kind of go with it, but I also, I'm doing this at a distance, so I don't always get as many um, appointments 
as um, you would if you were in person. Okay, I hear you. Okay, so thank you for sharing that. That was a lot. I know we just went <laughs> like, No worries. Uh, so and I'm gonna turn oh, some, oh, sorry, you're oh, so no. recording. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna um, move on to the next segment. And this last one okay. I'm really excited about because Justine will be, um, you know, you'll be talking about all the mental health and physical health, um, you know, um, lessons and, and how you got through it all. So stick with us. <laughs> 